How would you like to be the answer to someone's prayer? Have you ever seen a completely dark area transformed? And what does this have to do with revival? Stay tuned, you'll find out. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey. Let's jump right in. Today, we're going on an exploration. In a time where Christian values are attacked, we look at the history to see how God's light on the situation transformed areas and nations. Every time we find with enough of God's light put into action, God's people take their rightful places and the attack gets stalled. Well, what started us doing Revival Radio TV was digging into what created Christian revivals in the first place. Well, we learned both good guys do what God asks and the bad guys have worked to stall God's work often at the very same time. First up, A.J. Gordon. He was told healing wasn't for today and he began looking for all the documented times that healing had ever taken place. He didn't expect to have his book generate a full healing revival, yet it did. It tells about the healing throughout the ages, and it's some powerful stuff. Then you have Mrs. Edward Mix. She was a dressmaker. Tuberculosis was very often a one-way ticket to heaven. She lost her parents and then her seven children. Yet God would call her to do something more for God than she had ever done. She heard his call to go work today in my vineyard. Sarah Mix resisted the call and came under conviction. You are not disqualified. So we have Sarah Mix, who is about to become the first black healing evangelist. She didn't feel qualified to minister. Finally struggling, wanting to do this, but feeling inadequate, she asked God for a sign that this call was from him. She fell asleep and she had a dream where a cloud of fire formed into crowns and one of them actually engulfed her. She became overwhelmed by the glory of God and could only praise him. Her vision was prayer. One room, a few people. God's vision showed that they would pray, but that he had a surprise. There was also an imparted anointing that would birth ministries all the way through the mid 20th century. We'll get into this impartation with one of her students, but the point is, you've got to understand that we sometimes think we know what's going to come from something, but history shows us what God actually births from your work and your calling. Carrie Judd Montgomery was a student of Mrs. Mick's anointing and ministry. My name is Carrie Judd Montgomery. I want to be used of God, but surrendering to God really frightened me Would he ask me to abandon my dreams? Yet I yearned to know God personally. I found amazing truths in the Bible. When you hear God speak through his word, it is as easy to believe as it is to take your next breath. If you have ever had an experience of this kind, the memory of it will always encourage you to trust him. Then I had a bad fall. I probably broke my back. In any case, I was bedfast for two years. My father read about Mrs. Edward Mix, who had experienced a healing of tuberculosis and had a ministry of praying for the sick. We sent her a letter asking for prayer. And as they prayed in their Wednesday prayer time, I was able to rise from my bed and walk. The question is, Does surrendering to Christ mean you lose your dreams? I think not. Every time I walked down the stairs, I was reminded, God loves you. Yet for my dreams, I also wanted to be a writer. I have to say, God lets your dreams come true. God led me to begin a periodical triumphs of faith and I published for 65 years. Actually, I have to say, he starts with your dreams and then he expands from there. 
I traveled and spoke in conferences worldwide in my home of peace, the healing home my husband and I opened. When the Azusa Street Revival began, I published reports and received my own Pentecostal experience in 1908. Dreams do come true. What are your dreams? When I was a girl, bedfast, unable to walk, who could have imagined what God had coming for me? With God, all things are possible. When you let God into your life, you get to see the impossible made possible. All it takes is hunger for all God has for you. Believe. God calls his people to holiness and to healing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This quiet lady saw prayer bring about miracles. Many of us have, well, we've never heard of these ladies before, but God saw to it that we heard what they taught through the top evangelists into the mid 20th century. You belong outside. There is no standard for what a Christian looks like. George Jeffries was a miner, and so was Evan Roberts. Mrs. Mix was a dressmaker. We can make Jesus our Lord just as we are. God takes you in partnership and you go from there. It's why male or female, God calls us. Dr. Cho had 10,000 small cell groups that formed the basis of his mega church, but he needed leadership. In many of the American churches, 60% of the people attending services had been ladies. In Korea, after the Korean War in 1953, 75% of the people attending services were ladies. God told Cho to recruit his ladies. He said they're about to become ministers. They were already busy blessing others, and they were already able intercessors. You have a gift. Carrie Judd Montgomery, she has Mrs. Mix anointing, and she has a notable reputation. It lets her go to the next level where she was used as a bridge between evangelicals and the Pentecostals. To the evangelicals, she had a voice to introduce spirit baptism to them without all the fanaticism, and to the Pentecostals, she remained balanced and didn't overemphasize the practice of speaking in tongues. By 1914, she was part of what would later be called the Assemblies of God. She started as a charter member before becoming an Assemblies minister and realized this was just before World War I. Throughout her life, Carrie became personal friends with many leaders. Let me pick a few of the hundreds she was in contact with. Have you ever heard of any of these people? A.B. Simpson, William Booth, Minnie Abrams, Maria Woodworth Etter, William J. Seymour, getting, a, getting an idea? Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Simple McPherson, John G. Lake, Finus Yoakum, George Peck. Wow. Did this quiet lady impact some of the most of the major evangelists of the Christian movement in the 20th century? Yes, she did. Not bad for a woman who started out bedfast and paralyzed and a protege of the first black lady evangelist. The word of God is still living and active and it lasts forever. In 1902, Evan Roberts gave up coal mining and became a blacksmith. He went from possibly being blown up in the mines to now he's working near fire and flame. His three-year apprenticeship with his uncle was four miles from his home. Now in this pre-automobile era, he had a four mile walk home. What would you do with that much time every day? Evan's free time was taken up with the Lord. Reports say he would read the Bible for hours, oblivious to any noises around him. Before the 20th century and often built in leisure time, people were used to working long hours. Benjamin Franklin learned math after he got off work. How many of us work 50 hour work weeks, then work through a math textbook just to keep expanding our skills? So the mindset of just trying things was part of that culture. By age 15, Evan was teaching local children's Sunday school. He himself considered these 13 years before the revival as a continuous preparation for the work he was called to do. 
It's always better to be famous in heaven. Evans didn't go from minor to minister with nothing. In a nation where to become a minister was a challenging time, consuming chore, well, Roberts was the outsider. In a time where sermons were often formulaic, even if there was good content, Roberts relied on music and following the move of God. It was not the status quo in the mainline ministers. Well, they weren't happy with it. Awakenings will never follow what we think they should. Joseph Jenkins was used to ignite the original flame for the Welsh revival, but it was Evan Roberts to stoke the fire so that it spread powerfully over the nation. If you remember anything about Evan Roberts, you will remember his training came via early morning meetings with the Lord. His life-changing moment was hearing the minister say the words, bend me. The rest of that minister sermon was wonderful, but two words went deep into Evan Roberts' soul, bend me. This boy faithfully helped his family when his dad was injured, faithfully entered the mines when all too often deaths took place. The mines were really dangerous places. He was faithful, small or not. Now that same team is now embracing Christ. Early morning meetings in the Welsh revival is hot and the Spirit of God is all over Wales blessing the people. Here's something I had not heard before. Abertillery was a booming commercial center for families looking for work. You could find coal there and more of it. Churches might have been thriving, but when the Welsh revival hit Wales like a hurricane, it was only 10 weeks, but more than 10% of the population of this town found Christ. How many people are in your town? What would 10% newly born again look like? How would you mentor and teach all those new converts? Our faithful miner with no formal education probably held 50 meetings his first month. By the end of the year, South Wales was ablaze with, according to the Western Mail, at least 34,000 converts, although many towns had not yet sent in their returns. By autumn of 1905, people had heard of the revival all over Wales, and groups of mainly young people started prayer meetings to pray for what was happening. The fire fell even more in many areas. The 100,000 souls that Roberts had heard prophesied and prayed for came in with all denominations benefiting. So with the Welsh revival, crime is reduced. We have judges giving the white glove test because there are simply no cases to hear. The peace found on the other side of an awakening is notable. We have mules you have to retrain since they were being cussed out as a norm. Now it's changed. While we might be shocked today to hear a secular paper is enthusiastic over a Christian revival, or perhaps most shocking of all, actually reciting the facts correctly, let's go back to the town of Abertillery, which 10% of them now are new Christians. Their local paper in the South Wales Gazette actually was a good paper. Here's an example of what they posted. The revival has been the absorbing theme of thought and discussion. The war, trade, politics, and even football have been thrown into the shade as topics of general conversation. Drunkards have been soberized. Publicans have lost much business. Conduct on public streets has been elevated. Police and magistrates have quieter times. The bottom of the pits are now centers for prayer and praise meetings. Almost everybody's talking about it, thinking about it, or working in its interest, and the movement does not seem to flag at all. Converts are made nightly, and the enthusiasm is intensifying and spreading. Chapel is packed in the afternoon, a warmer feeling in the assembly. Imagine black faces, work clothes, boxes and jacks. This is who attended on their way home from work. A church report gives this example of what the people were doing. Quote, a young man in the gallery prayed for his salvation of shop assistants and their temptations. The people's prayers followed rapidly after, and there was great intensity of feeling throughout the meeting. Here's another one. One elderly matron made an impressive appeal to those in the prime of life to acknowledge the Savior. This one gets me. A young man near Liverpool said, they wanted to know the might of God in England too. 
He was a student in Leeds and traveled 240 miles to attend that meeting, part of the way on a bicycle. Pray for students. They do not understand the temptations of college life. Now, this is from secular newspapers. We should still pray for our college students too. That town saw revival and saw it in a big way. Here's the last one. The congregation got on their knees and engaged in prayer in both languages and at the same time. The effect was most transforming. Revivals and awakenings don't happen the way we expect, but God has people who need to find Him. Let's do our part to make this possible. All through centuries, we see this. God raises up someone, and we might credit them with a revival. However, as you dig into it, you learn of dozens, if not hundreds, who also stepped up. When we began studying events like the prayer revival of 1857, we thought of it as our nation's revival. Yes, they thought this was my revival. God is moving here. People are saved. They were hungry for God, committed to expand whatever God wanted done. Economic chaos didn't just impact America. Research tells us banks failed in England, not just America, in the panic of 1857. Economically, every stock market was closed worldwide. Yet why would we even think about what happened before the revival, right? We saw the revival in the million people who found Christ, along with the million who rededicated their lives to the Lord. We track the revival all over the world. Usually when we talk revivals in church, we don't look for the context. We're just excited that someone's been born again. However, so many are finding Jesus, we get excited about that. The trend that a big revival ends up being a worldwide event, though, just keeps repeating. Why and how does this happen? Number one, God was moving and people began stirring that up so their area did see revival. We saw this in Africa, in Tasmania, among other nations. Number two, another way was that they heard about the prayer revival and they sent people over to see what was going on and then took it home. And guess what? Revivals followed. We found this in Sweden, Ireland, France, Australia, to just name a few of the nations. Here we are in the Welsh revival, and again, we see the same dynamic. We can pick dozens of other times in history and see it happen again and again. 1860, 1880, and just in case this was limited to a particular century, we traced back from the inception of the early church and the Apostle Paul with his myriad of revivals, we see this repeating still. Remember, Paul walked into town with his two missionary friends and they were the only ones that knew Jesus. He was literally bringing the wheel to an unsaved town and saying, this is a wheel. Now let me show you what you can do with it. Jacob de Shazar said to the Japanese at the start of his ministry in Japan, I know that the Japanese are very educated people, but I don't think they know what happened 2,000 years ago, so I'm going to bring them up to date. Through his ministry, thousands would find Christ, and Jake would end up planting 23 churches. If you're in a place where you are the only Christian and everyone around you are notable heathens, you know exactly what Paul experienced. Paul came to town and began talking to one person or he shared at a synagogue, and he saw many converts. Take your pick of heroes, though. Priscilla, who was with Paul in Ephesus, couldn't stand the heathen treatment of women, so part of her task was changing what she hated into something good. She began a tremendous women's movement. Women in the early church liked Christianity. They could lead, and there weren't any religious men saying, oh, you're a woman, you can't do that. Instead, in the early church, women had authority and liberty and could do anything God told them to do. Priscilla was impassioned to take broken women from that heathen town and get them help and training and start a new life. With the Welsh revival, we have also seen revival spreading. From even correspondence being written after Evan stopped actively going to the churches, missionaries took this gospel to Korea India, France, Madagascar, and a dozen other countries. The revival just kept expanding. So never discount small beginnings. 
History and God will share the value of what you actually do. If you take anything away from this, I hope you take this. It's important to realize this. Number one, you're not disqualified. You are not allowed to use your personal history as an excuse to not be used by God. Evan Roberts himself was an uneducated minor, not a minister. The list of preachers who couldn't speak had to be healed of an impediment so they could formulate a sentence, had to be healed of a life-threatening disease. The list is long. It's notable. And like Evan, if you don't really want to fully preach in all the services, let the singers praise God and be the voice of revival. If you have a life-threatening disease like tuberculosis, which Lester Summerall had, and Oral Roberts and even David Yonggi Cho also had, guess what? God can heal that. In short, you're not disqualified. Number two, and this is the one I like, you belong outside. We are called to be a light in a dark and slumbering world, and this is where the awakening happens. You can be like Evan was, a rebel minister. The apostle Paul got jailed, and God birthed an entire church from that. Demas Shikarian took his message to the businesses of America. At one point, his website said one million found Jesus annually. John Wesley and others preached outside where the people were. Where are the people in your area? A.A. A. Allen says preachers came into his dance hall where he worked before he was saved. Joan Hunter says, pray for someone in a store where you shop. Start reaching out. Kenneth Copeland said he would preach anywhere someone would listen. And he's done just that. From one person to crowds so large it's hard to number, Brother Copeland has walked this out over the decades, and he is surely faithful. All right, number three, you have a gift. Sure, you may not be an actor or have a love for theater like we see with Amy Simple McPherson, but you have a gift and a passion for something. Every revival is something God puts together and loves to do. Your talent, even if you don't know what it is yet, is ready to be birthed to the glory of God. Bill James, evangelist, has preached in the mega churches of Korea since the 1980s, and he says, my abilities can fit into a thimble, but God is without limit. Listen, God is planning to use you for his glory. Pay attention, watch for it, expect it. Number four, the word of God is still living and active, and it lasts forever. Follow Evan's example and immerse yourself in the word of God. Find the way that works for you in this season. You might read a verse and ponder it. You might read the whole Bible through in a year. The reality is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Make it real, make it yours, and enjoy the good news. However you explore the word, allow it to anchor you, change you, and then feed it to others. Number five, it's always better to be famous in heaven. The materials for so many of the people we explored are often so scantily available. Most wrote no books, and you have to dig into diaries, news articles, and even interview people to gain some history. Few headed as many crusades against an apostate church with a nation at his back and princes on his side like Martin Luther did. Even those who founded often hundreds of churches often found in no religious denomination, yet pin faith on the Bible, and God knows who they are. We don't know every name of every notable person, yet God does. Like the writings of John Wesley and his ministry, we find he became the spiritual father of England. Yet today, we don't know how many things we think are normal actually were teachings John Wesley taught. England embalmed his best, and today we still hear about Christian charity and a spirit of giving and volunteerism. Even if your work is known for a moment and its effects are impacting people a century from now, but you are forgotten, God never forgets what you did or your obedience. We have revivals that were moves of God, then all of those people went into local churches and took the fire there. There was the child teen evangelist in the 1920s who pulled in crowds larger than Billy Sunday could ever do. We have no numbers of how many accepted Christ under her ministry, but we know many did. She had no denomination founded as Amy Simple McPherson had. She simply was impassioned to share Christ. And billions of people have shared Jesus neighbor to neighbor. History in God says that that expands the family of God the fastest. 
one-on-one, -on -one, neighbor to neighbor. Have you ever led someone to the Lord? It can be intimidating, but God's going to carefully note the record so large and full in heaven, I have no doubt. So whether you lead one person or dozens, obedience is what matters. No worries if what you do seems few, even scanty. Just do John 2, 5. Whatever he says to you, do it. So, in other words, be the one. When you have a library closing in on 350,000 books, you pretty much never run out of revivals to talk about. Thanks for letting me share some thoughts. We find there's always another gem about to be discovered. Bill Jane said this, people are hesitant to ask because they don't want to inconvenience a minister who's already there and has been praying for people for hours. They would rather go home and hurt rather than be a burden. I hope that if that's you, you realize today God wants you to inconvenience him. He wants you to talk incessantly, giving him requests. You have to know this is a spiritual promise, a scriptural promise. Proverbs 10, 24b, the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Give him some granting to do. He wants to be there for you. He wants to be your friend, your confidant, and he wants to tell you that you matter. He loves you. Take the time to let him say that to you. Grab a journal and write down what he says. He wants to see you doing great, as John 10.10 10 says, because we are honoring Jesus when we experience life and life more abundantly. When you do well, it's to the glory of God. We talked about a lot this time. You are amazing, and this is really the most important part. God wants to see you with breakthroughs, and he is the Lord of the breakthrough. So do you need healing? He's the Lord who heals us. You have the mind of Christ and you can do all things through him who strengthens you. Life-threatening issues, guess what? God's greater. You're too tired, too busy, too something. God has Luke 8, 17 answers for you. I love that verse. God makes the hidden things become found. The unseen things become seen. The answers you need to see, well, God has that too. You need result? He's got this. Every name of God is embedded into the name of Jesus. So let me pray for you guys right now. Father, everyone watching tonight, wherever they're watching, whatever time of day this is, Lord, I pray that you quicken in their hearts just how much you love them. Create a desire for scripture to see and understand who you are, to read the word and become uh, intimate with you in a relationship with you. Father, I thank you for everyone watching today in Jesus' name. Amen. So glad you're with me today. We'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV.